Today, we have a very special guest, Olympic medalist, Marissa McKeldin. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Hi, Black Kids and family. Good to have to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to read off Marissa McClendon's um, background. Um, you are a 2004 Olympic silver medalist and the first African-American woman to make a U.S. Um, Olympic swim team and medal. At the age of seven, you were diagnosed with um, severe scoliosis and your doctor recommended swimming as a medical remedy. Um, Maritza is a 27-time All-American, 11 NCAA titles. Um, she's the first African-American female to break an individual American work record, which was in 2002, and break a world record back in 2000 in swimming. Um, although um, Marissa is no longer swimming competitively, she is still actively engaging in communities nationwide to inspire people to lead a healthy lifestyle through sports, especially swimming. Additionally, she is a passionate advocate for the importance of um, safe water safety among minorities of all ages and travels the country frequently to speak about this life-saving skill. So she candidly shares her life um, lessons about sparing any details and hopes to inspire others to overcome hesitation, fear, and disappointment. And your motto, Maritza, is turn any negative situation into something positive and never give up. So we're going to take the time to ask Marissa a few questions. But um, if you all have any personal questions on your own, we're going to give the last few minutes for you to ask your questions um, after our talk. So hi, Marissa. How are you today? Hi, Brianna. I'm doing good. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, no problem. No problem. So now that I've read your professional background, Tell me in your own words, who is Maritza and what is important to you? <laughs> um, well, I'm Maritza McClendon, 2004 Olympic silver medalist and first black woman to make a U.S. Olympic swim team. You know, I will say when I first got that title, I had no idea the power behind it. It was more of I was trying to make my dreams come true, becoming an Olympian and icing on the cake was to break history. Mm -hmm. um, Fast forward a, a little bit later and I realized and understood the, the power behind what I accomplished and there is a reason why I need to be a role model to get my black kids and my black community um, to, to be involved with the sport. You know, I think for us, it's a little bit more of a um, you know, a necessity, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily think of water <laughs> and swimming in the pool, but we really have to understand the importance of water safety education. So, you know, as I went through my career of having those ups and downs where, you know, some days I would have fantastic swims and other days I wouldn't have great swims, but I continue to pick myself back up. I had moments where, you know, parents were, you know, parents and other people on the pool deck were asking me, why was I there? And it was because of the color of my skin. You know, they'd be asking me, you know, why don't you go do track or why don't you go do basketball? Just telling me that I should go the, the, the black mainstream sports. And it was like, no, I really have a passion for swimming. This is something that I love and I continue to strive. Um, you know, and I also dealt with a lot of parent pressure along the way. And we'll go into more detail about this, but this is just kind of a quick, you know, I'm an Olympic swimmer and I am a swimmer just like many of you out there listening right now. And I had a goal that I wanted to accomplish. And thankfully for me, that goal also made me a history maker. And I wanted to dive right into being a role model for, for my community children for hopefully the rest of my life. You know, this is something that I absolutely love. I love sharing my story and sharing all the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, and just want to encourage our young athletes, and our next generation to to, to know that there are no barriers and you can break and, and if there are you can break those down no no problem about it you know just put your mind to it be determined stay focused and go after your goals okay sounds good so can you take us back down like memory lane tell me about how your swim experience was like growing up because i know you started when you were seven years old Yep, so I was actually diagnosed with scoliosis at six, which is curvature of the spine. And my doctor recommended that I get into swimming or gymnastics. Mm -hmm. My dad is about six three, six four, so figured I'd be a little bit on the tall side for gymnastics. And I always love the water. So my mom was like, okay, let's go ahead and try some lessons and see how it goes. So 
I learned basic water safety skills of how to get from one end of the pool to the other. And, um, and, and it wasn't somebody's backyard pool. It wasn't anything fancy by any means, but it, it was the spark of, of a career, of a long lasting career. So it sparked that joy, like how much I really loved swimming, how much I loved the competitive aspect of it. And I'll tell you a quick story. You know, at the end of our summer swim team or summer swim lessons, it wasn't even swim team, swim lessons, our coach was like, okay, let's do some relays. Granted, I'm like six, seven years old and the, the everybody else is too, we're doing a relay. You know, you have one person swim, then you hand, you touch the wall and the next person dives in. Well, the girl who went in after me did not want to go. You know, we, we were winning after my leg, we were winning. And then she decided that she didn't want to go. And I was just like, come on, we're winning. Like, get in the water, do something. And instead of being encouraging, I decided to hop out the pool and I pushed the girl in. So that is where my competitive nature started. My mom was like, okay, I'm a little bit embarrassed that this happened. But we're going to go ahead and get back, get into the water. And she found a, a great swim team for me. I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. My parents are from Guyana in South America and we were surrounded by water. So there were swim teams that I was able to join at that moment, but my swimming career didn't really take off until I moved to Florida where, you know, I had the opportunity to swim under Olympic coach Peter Banks. And he has coached Olympians Brooke Bennett from 96 games and 2000 Olympic games, as well as other Olympians from different countries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't say that I walked on the pool deck and I was the fastest swimmer by any means. I walked in just wanting to learn how to get better. How do I improve my skill set? How do I, um, what can I do to, to just be one of the, one of, you know, actually it wasn't to be one of the top athletes. It was literally, how do I just keep coming back to practice because I loved practicing so much? Mm. Um, you know, and it, and it wasn't until further along in my career where I had a moment that, um, you know, I swam an amazing race when I was 12 in the 500 freestyle. And I suddenly had a junior national cut you know, to have a junior national cut at the age of 12 is pretty rare. And, um, but it was also the, the moment in my career where it clicked like, okay, I do have some sort of talent. I need to commit a little bit more because initially the previous years, I was excited to just be at practice and I would, um, you know, I grew up in Florida, so it wasn't, it's not like it got cold. I'm sure some of you guys are up North where it does actually get cold and it snows, but in the winter I would disappear. So like I would be 10 years old and it's like winter training. Uh, no, thanks. It's about 50 degrees outside, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so, so I would totally disappear from the pool deck. And then when I made my junior national cut at 12, it was kind of like a shift in my thinking and, and realizing, okay, I have some sort of talent. If I commit a little bit more, let's see where it's going to take me. Mm. And, you know, by the time I was 13, I made my first senior national cut where I was at U.S. Nationals swimming against you know, future current Olympians and future Olympians. And, you know, throughout the entire process had the, the, the butterflies in my stomach, the, the notions of like, okay, should I be here? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, is this really what I want to do? I also, I mentioned earlier, had some parent pressure. So that added a little bit more complexity to my career, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I continue to persevere. So when I got to high school, you know, I made sure that I, I walked through every single um, step in states and making sure that I got some good times and some good placements. I was able to earn a scholarship into swimming. And um, I ended up, at the end of the day, ended up going to University of Georgia for my college career. And, um, you know, that kind of led into a little bit more about, you know, what, where is my career going now? You know, I was in college. Um, consider one of the top athletes in the country. I was starting to improve in my strokes and definitely had aspirations to become an Olympian. Mm -hmm. for, for some of you, I don't, I don't know how many of your, um, uh, how many of yours out there that know Amy Van Dyken, but she is a 96 Olympic gold medalist. She won four Olympic gold medals at the 96 games. And she was my inspiration. She's the reason why I wanted to be an Olympian. So as I went through my high school career, that was like my main focus of like, how do I keep improving and how do I set myself out to, to become an Olympian? And I definitely had some major disappointments. Um, you know, I had where I would go through, 
you know, I, I went up to NCAAs in my freshman year in college, had a fantastic <laughs> NCAA meet and, you know, came off being one of the top two swimmers um, in the country at that point heading into Olympic trials. And, you know, unfortunately, things didn't really work out the way that I was expecting. You know, I, I went up behind the block. I had my nerves that hit me. I was wondering where my coaches were, where were my parents, you know, how do, you know, I just wanted to, I had all these distractions and I wasn't focused on my race. So unfortunately I didn't make the team in 2000. Um, I refocused for another four years and I came back even stronger for 2004. So that was a long, <laughs> long little walk down memory lane, but I guarantee you like Every, everybody's story is going to be different. And I want to encourage you guys to find what your story, what your path of success is, but also don't be afraid to look to idols to look up to and see what other athletes have gone through. You know, there is a lot of opportunities where um, you guys are connected to the internet. You can find out on social media more about athletes. Blackkidsswim.com has featured many athletes and gives you many tips. So don't be afraid to go out there and and read up and get a little bit more knowledge about some of the things that, that previous athletes have done so that you can kind of build your path to success. Yeah, that's exactly like what I was going to follow up with because like you are an inspiration to many people, especially people who are tuning in right now. And you know, a lot of people love you because you made history, but like, you know, for the younger generation, what advice would you give like young swimmers who want to make a lasting impact in the swim world and do, do, and like be just like you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest advice is, is what we had said earlier with my motto of turn any negative situation as something positive and never give up. So if you have an aspiration, even if it's not in swimming, maybe it's a, a different sport or maybe it's in a, you know, a subject at school, have those different goals um, and, and go after them and be sure to, once you reach a goal, to reassess and make new ones. Mm -hmm. Same thing with swimming. Make sure that you have a lasting impression where you're a great teammate. I can tell you that I don't think I would have made it through my swimming career without having my teammates help me along the way. They didn't know my situation at home with my debt, the pressure that I received from my dad, but I, to them, they, they were my teammates. They were my family. It was all about, you know, all of us stepping to the same beat and we were together and pushing each other, encouraging each other, even if it wasn't a great meet or we lost a swim meet, we were still there together and pushing each other along. Um, and then also too, just, you know, I think, it, and I mentioned this early, I think it's great to have people to look up to, but know that your path will be different yeah. and your, your success will look different than anybody else. But if you want to have a lasting career, make sure that you are, and you, and you leave an impact in swimming, make sure you do all that you can to, to leave a good mark, whether it's having great races and pairing it with a positive attitude and an attitude that wants to give back. So don't be afraid to be a mentor, you know, learn, be a mentee now and, and have somebody to look up to that provides some guidance for you, mm -hmm. but also don't, fo don't forget to pay, pay it forward. So be a good mentor, be a good teammate, be encouraging, and, and definitely don't forget that you're something for yourself and go after your own goals. Mm -hmm. And I know that you, like um, earlier, you spoke about like some kind of obstacles that you faced to get to like where you are today, like where you are now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people talk about the physical obstacles that you may have to come across to um, reach your goals. But can you take like a deeper dive into like the mental issues that you probably had to overcome, just like you said with parent pressure, but can you talk more about that? Yeah, so throughout my entire career, I had, I dealt with a lot of parent pressure. Um, my, you know, my mom was very, very supportive in anything that I did, anything and everything I did. She would work 12 hours as a nurse and still find a way to get me to school, wake me up for practice, get me to practice, get me back from school, get me back to practice, get me to swim meets on the weekend. I mean, you name it, she was doing it. Um, and then I had my dad, on the other hand, who he was an athlete growing up. He did crew. So for those of you guys who don't know, it's rowing. And um, he unfortunately blew out his knee before he reached his prime. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if a little bit of that played into our relationship too of, you know, he really wanted me to continue to excel. And it was a disappointment to him when I didn't win. So that was, that was always a challenge of, of balancing like, okay, I would go to practice. I'd work really hard. Then I'd go to a swim meet and the performance wasn't there. 
Yeah. And, you know, I was hard on myself when that happened. But then on top of that, I had the, my dad who was like, you know, coming down hard on me saying that I'm wasting my coach's time that I, you know, I should be doing better, like what happened. And mm -hmm. there's always some sort of, of long conversation as to why I wasn't swimming well, you know, instead of the encouraging portion of it, it was more drilling me as to like, why didn't you do better? Mm -hmm. So, and that, that actually, you know, kept going throughout my entire swim career, even all the way through high school. I'll give you a quick story of, I went to high school state championships as a freshman and I was ready to go in. I was swimming the 500 freestyle and 200 freestyle. I was one of the top uh, athletes at that point too. And I was expected to win. My school had never had uh, a high school state champion before. So we were super excited. I felt like I was ready for it and the nerves hit me and I, I just yeah. completely froze up and did not have a great race, but my coaches, my teammates were like, it's okay. You're a freshman. You know, this is a great experience, great way to get you started. We got three more years to improve. Mm -hmm. And then my dad came along and said that I let my entire team down. You know, mm -hmm. he said some of the the hardest things that you, you know, it wasn't even like, oh, are you okay? Like, I know it wasn't a great race, but you also let your team down. It was just, he led with, you let your entire team down. And I think that was, that was extremely hard to deal with. And I almost quit swimming at that point. I'm sure that, you know, high, for a lot of people, high school swimming is one of the hardest times because as you guys know, as swimmers, time commitment to, to the sport is high. So I wasn't able to hang out with my friends. I wasn't doing going to the movies on the weekends and doing things like that. It was really focused on swimming and going to swim meets. So I really thought about quitting um, the sport at, at my freshman year in high school. And going back to being great teammates, my teammates helped me persevere. They kind of were in my in my head about, you know what, you're a great swimmer. Don't let this one one event, this one meet kind of put you down and, and define the, your entire career. Mm -hmm. um, had a great coach who was very supportive. And again, my mom, you know, my mom was always in my corner. So she kind of helped me get through that situation. And here we go three more years where I was able to win two state titles um, for different events every single year. So sophomore, junior and senior year, I walked away with um, state titles. Um, and then I, as I mentioned before, I, I com continue to deal with this pressure coming in from every angle. So, you know, physically, I felt really good in the water. I was training super hard. I'm hitting these mental barriers of my dad's giving me pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, I had parents on the teams that were saying, you know, why, why are you doing swimming? Shouldn't you be doing a different sport? I was, me and my family were one of two to three families at a time that were black on our on our swim team, so we were rare. You know, there was a, it was a rare sighting. Um, and then, you know, I also had the media. <laughs> you know, the media comes in, and you know, they they want to they know that history can be made, and they want to um, you know bring light to that. And there was a lot of pressure coming in from that end. But I think as swimmers and as human beings, we need to figure out how do we balance the, those types of pressures to um, to a healthy level. You know, I think that there shouldn't be an expectation that you won't get pressure by right. any means, but there, there should be a way that you can handle that. And for me, it took a lot. It took a lot of, um, you know, after the biggest disappointment of not making 2000 Olympic trials or Olympic games, I saw somebody professionally. And the biggest takeaway that I had is that my issue was that I dealt with things and I dealt with it by myself. I didn't share the issues with anybody else. It was just something that I internalized and that made it harder. It was like I was keeping all this weight on myself. And I want to strongly encourage people to know that you need to have an outlet. If you have an issue, have an outlet to talk about it and to come to an agreement of like, how do I improve or how do I make things a little bit better, or a little bit easier, a little bit smoother. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll know that you'll see that across, you know, whether you're swimming you're at school or you're dealing with family. Yeah. And one thing I want you to talk about a little bit more because you know black kids swim well, you know, huge proponents of um, black kids actually swimming, you know. Mm -hmm. But tell me about how times have changed because I know that you talked about like you and your family were like one of two or three family members at your meets. How yeah. did you um, maneuver as a black swimmer and, and how has it changed throughout the years like witnessing more um, black kids being involved in the sport? 
Yeah, I will say, as I mentioned before, I was one of the few, me and my family were one of the few on our SWIM team. I have had the opportunity to continue to stay involved with swimming throughout, you know, beyond my years as a competitive swimmer. And I can tell you that I noticed the difference. There are definitely um, more black people that are involved with SWIM, more people that are thinking about it. There's still a lot of work to be done. You guys can see on your screen right now that USA Swimming has over 330,000 members and only 1.3% are black. Like that, that to me is like, but why, <laughs> you know, we need to make a difference, but uh -huh. I will tell you the numbers are definitely changing and I'm seeing a big difference. When I made the Olympic team in 2004, I, it was 70% of African-American children didn't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. The percentage of blacks on USA swimming membership was even lower than 1.3%. And then I can't even tell you, you know, when I went to nationals or even trials, um, I could count how many of us were on, at the meet in one hand, you mm -hmm. know, now, you know, I, I can go through and count on the deck, <laughs> you know, how many are there. Um, but, you know, those numbers are, are starting to reduce. You know, recently a new study came out that 64% of African-American children don't know how to swim. And a lot of people are like, well, that's only 6%. Mm -hmm. That actually translates to millions of kids who didn't know how to swim, now know how to swim. But it also alerts us that there's still work to be done, um, you know, when the, and which is what my whole passion is, you know, yeah. seeing that 70% of African American children didn't know how to swim when I became an Olympian and, be, and made history kind of sparked that, that, that need and that, that desire to, how do I, how do I change that? How do I reduce these numbers? Mm -hmm. And, and I will say that water safety is so important um, for everybody, but especially for our community kids, yeah. because we drown at a higher rate than any other race, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. And um, but those, those things can change. And I think that's kind of like where the base starts. Like you just need to have people that, um, are interested in swimming just as an introduction to water safety, but it can turn into something else. So like it can turn into a, a swimming career, a competitive swimming career, where we're going to start to see that 1.3% increase at USA mm -hmm. Swimming. There's so many opportunities that come along with swimming. Mm -hmm. um, you can be a lifeguard. You can make a lot of money being a lifeguard. <laughs> you know, you can, um, you can be a coach. You can, um, you can go into the Navy. There, there's just so many different opportunities that swimming offers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that while the numbers are still pretty low, we still are seeing a lot of great athletes. And you guys can see here on your screen, we have Guile Smith, we have Ariana Wallace, we have Alia Atkinson, Justin Lynch, we have Reese uh, uh, Whitley, we have Simone Manuel, we have Leah Neal. I mean, I can go on and on with the names and people that you guys should be looking out for and seeing great things coming coming about down the pipeline. But you guys, this is your inspiration. This is the generation that you guys aspire to be. and. It's, I think it'll be even cooler for those of you who are listening to be that inspiration for the generation behind you. Like this is how our, our swimming community is going to continue to, to build and grow and get stronger. Yeah. And you know that you were talking about like, you know, you no longer competitively swim, but you're still an advocate. Can you tell me more about like your participation with SWIM 1922 and even Black Kids Swim and how you're helping to reduce, like further reduce these numbers and increase the number like in involvement with USA Swimming? Right. So I, you know, when I first made my Olympic history, um, you know, knowing that there were so few of us that were involved with the sport, it kind of sparked that, that idea of like, okay, well, what else can be done? Mm -hmm. And the first couple of years, I did a couple of things here and there, but it wasn't anything to me. It wasn't enough to me. Like I wanted, I wanted to figure out how can I connect directly to the black communities? And I've been thankful right. enough to get connected with Swim 1922, which is a partnership with uh, Sigma Gamma Rho and USA Swimming where our main purpose is to go into the black communities and offer that education and introduction to water safety. So when you think about it, like there is a, when you're on a swim team, you're kind of already involved with swimming, you know, and it's a matter of keeping you involved. When you don't have swimming as part of your conversation, there's gotta be some way to offer that, that introduction and that connection. So that's what some 1922 has offered. We travel the country, 
We offer free swim clinics. I'm there for a, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, Colin Jones also comes with me. And I know Black Kids Swim has helped us with a few that were up in DC. So that was, that's been pretty amazing of just, you know, encouraging that, that, you know, for people to take action, you know, it's, it's more than just a sport for us as swimmers. We do think of it as a sport, but for everybody else, it's a life-saving skill that honestly, everybody needs to know. It's very true, very true. Yeah, well, um, one thing I know that you talked about, you know, that's like the basis of our conversation is being resilient. You know, you've broken barriers and um, we're hoping that people who come behind you continue to do so, right? But can you talk about like any advice that you could give our young swimmers now? Like we're dealing with this pandemic. Many swimmers cannot be in the pool right now. And we're trying, well, they're trying to stay afloat and like, you know, trying to stay positive and trying to find ways to continue to keep themselves active. So mm -hmm. can you talk about resiliency and what advice would you give um, our swimmers now um, during this time? This, this is a very tough time for everybody. This is like uncharted waters, no pun intended, but um, you know, there, there's a lot of unknown. And I know a lot of you swimmers out there are not currently in the water or have been out of the water for several months at this point. And if you, and you guys know as swimmers, when we are out of the water, even if it's just for like a couple of days or a week, we get back in and it, you can't even feel the water. Like it just feels funny. Like every single stroke, I'm like, oh my God, I'm just like slipping through the water. I can't even grip it anymore. <laughs> like it's almost like you forgot how to swim. Um, but you know, th there are things that you guys can be doing now. And I want to strongly encourage you to, to stay active. You know, that this is not, the activity that you get isn't only in the water. So make sure that you're staying active outside of the water. You, you guys know we cross train. Mm -hmm. We're doing running, we're jump, doing jumping jacks, we are doing med ball training. Some of you may be doing weightlifting. I wanna encourage you to stay on that routine because um, it will kind of keep you keep you busy. You know, we're, we're swimmers and we stay on busy schedules and very stringent schedules. So this is a good, good way to just kind of continue to stay active. Mm -hmm. Build up your mental, your mental toughness. Start looking for webinars. I'm so proud of all you guys who are tuning in right now and those who will tune in later, but just make sure that you're looking out for what are some of the other athletes sharing? There's, you're hearing about some great stories from, you know, I've tuned in to some of the, the Olympians from, you know, uh, 1980 Olympic, 1984 Olympics that are sharing stories about how they got through their um, swimming careers and just understanding what are those different, what are those techniques that they're able to share? What's kind of like the words of wisdom that they can pass down? Mm -hmm. um, you guys are still connected to the internet. So stay focused on um, kind of building that mental toughness as a swimmer so that when you're ready, to go and you start racing it's kind of like okay I remember Marissa McClendon told me to, to turn any neg negative situation into something positive and go for it so mm -hmm. you just start getting ready to do that and I want to strongly encourage too and I'm totally guilty of this but the 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 fridge is <laughs> walking distance away <laughs> you know and as swimmers we burn a lot of calories when we're swimming but when you're you know when we're not swimming we don't, we want to make sure that we're not still eating as much as we were when we were swimming, but we want to make sure we're eating healthy choices too, making healthy choices. So I want to strongly encourage you to guys to, you know, this is something else that other athletes are sharing is like their nutrition. You know, what did they eat when they were competing? What do they eat on their off season? What are some of their favorite snacks? And maybe some of you guys might be little chefs and you didn't even know it. Go, go in the kitchen and start, you know, learning how to cook new, new recipes. Um, I've seen a lot of swim teams kind of share some of their favorite um, mealtime preps. Um, you know, when I can tell you, for me, when I go to a swim meet, I want to make sure that I am you know, I'm staying away from the fried foods, reducing the sodas, not going to McDonald's every week and things like that. Um, we're not asking for perfection by any means, but it's a matter of making, again, smart decisions and smart choices. And you can still do that even when you're not swimming. Um, it's a little bit harder when you have the fridge just right there, but, you know, I want to strongly encourage you guys to still stay um, active, um, still mentally tough, and then also eating well, continuing to eat well. Mm -hmm. All right, 
Sounds good. And just to make an announcement, you guys, on May 27th, we will have another live chat with um, Chef Sarita. So make sure that you will be able to tune in. And Marissa, I wanted to ask you this. Like, what were you like your favorite meals to make? Um, I guess to, you know, just not overindulge in food, but like what were your favorite meals to just, um, well, I guess, healthy eats? I would call it. Well, I'll, I'll say this, I and I share this very candidly. When I was a swimmer, I didn't eat the best were the healthiest. I wasn't one that was on a diet all the time. Um, it wasn't until my later years I understood the importance of nutrition, but some of my favorites were like McDonald's and um, I love the McDonald's fries. I still love it to this day. I love yeah. Snickers, <laughs> things like that, which, and, and I share that just to say that, you know, when I understood that what I was putting in my body wasn't the best, I started to perform even better. Mm. So, you know, you start to think about like some of my favorite meat snacks turned into, um, you know, bananas and peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Very simple, very easy, very nutritious. Um, you know, as I started to get a little bit older too, I started getting into cooking, you know, different foods. Like right now I cook for my family probably like five nights a week. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily like a health nut that like we're eating, you know, super healthy, but it's making, I would say smart, smart eating, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you, it's okay to have cake or okay to have a cupcake, but don't make it an everyday thing. You know, I definitely want to make sure that I'm doing like you know, my baked chicken instead of fried chicken, um, but it's okay to have it once in a while. So I'm very candid about like making sure that you have your own meal plans and your own nutrition needs met, um, but watch what you're eating. I, I'm into cars. I don't know how many of you guys are out there that knew that about me, or, or maybe you're into cars as well, but think Fast and the Furious style type of person. That's me. Um, I signed with Nike in 2003 as they were my official sponsor. And the first thing I did was I went out and bought a new car. Um, I bought a Nissan 350Z. I used to race it on the racetrack. I'd souped it up, put in a twin turbo kit, staggered rims. I had gauges in my car. I had a helmet, <laughs> you know, I went all out. So, you know, that was, that was me being me, but I, I kind of do this reference of, if you're, if you want to perform at your optimum, you're going to want to put in good gas. Yeah. When I was racing my 350Z, I didn't put the regular car gas that you get at the gas station. I went and got the high grade $20 a gallon, which now is probably way more expensive, $20 a gallon for 103 grade gas. And that's what I use to race. So I want to encourage you guys to to not necessarily be health nuts and be completely healthy every single time, but again, just make smart choices and, and reduce the, the bad fuel that you're putting into your body. Yes, most definitely. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I want to take the time for our viewers to ask questions for Maritza. You could ask any range of questions that you want, whether it be food, whether it be like physical questions, mental questions, or just like her accomplishments over the years. So please feel free to um, ask questions whenever you all feel like um, you have a thought to come up in your head. So um, Marissa, while, while we're waiting, I will about like a memory lane but tell me about how um let me see for a second how has the swim world changed over the years for you or like from what you've seen yeah I, I think that the swimming world has the the demographic has changed the speed <laughs> of the athletes have changed <laughs> you know we went through a period in 2008 where you know the tech suit the technology behind tech suits kind of overtook the, um, you know, the hard work that it takes to be a swimmer, be a, a strong competitive swimmer. But everybody broke all these world records that year, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, the suits is the suits actually made us break the world records or make these made these athletes faster." The, you know, made athletes who weren't training as much, they made them faster. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought for years we wouldn't see these world records be broken, and sure enough, here we are in 2020, and almost all those world records are off the table and have been broken in the last couple of years. So it's, it's, I think it's amazing to see how fast swimmers are getting. 
Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the access that you have to technology, the access that you have to athletes, the access that um, coaches have to learn more about the sport, more about the science behind the sport. Um, so I think I think the 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 scope of actually the love of swimming is still there, but I think what people are doing now is getting more involved with like the technique and how do I improve and there's more people that are interested in the sport than there were, you know, back in the day. So I think that we're just continuously evolving and I, and I, I love it. I think it's amazing. And of course I have to give a shout out. Like I love seeing more black people on the pool deck. <laughs> like that is just amazing to me more and more in the water. Um, and, and not just, not just swimming, um, like learning to swim. This is competitive athletes, top athletes uh, making national teams and, and um, making the Olympic teams. I think 20, now 2021 in Tokyo, we're going to see quite a few um, names going to pop up that we haven't seen before. Very true, very true. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, Rachel Hudson, she has a question. She wants to know, like, what, what was your favorite moment as a collegiate swimmer? Ah, there's so many. <laughs> That's a good question, Rachel. Um, so I have to say my favorite moment as a college swimmer was, well, first I'll say the experience. College swimming is like no other swimming out there. When you're an age group, it's about, you know, it's kind of a team, but it's more about your individual races and performing, you know, making your personal best times and things like that and making it to the next level. When you get to college, you have teammates that are with you at dual meets every week and you compete. Uh, for your college, like, there's just something about, you know, representing your college. It's kind of like representing Team USA, but you, you have... I went to Georgia. I can tell you I have a bathroom in here that is full Georgia, Georgia shower curtain, Georgia signs on the, on the side, Georgia toothbrush holder, you name it. <laughs> it's in there. So, so college swimming is amazing. And then my favorite experience from college is when I broke the American record. Um, in 2002, NCAA championship, um, I swam the 50 freestyle. And I will tell you before this, I had been swimming the mile. I swam the 500, I swam the 200. My sophomore year, I negotiated with my coach. I really want to swim the 50. That, that was like my favorite event was a 50 free and a 100 free. Mm -hmm. And my coach is like, okay, we'll try you out your junior year. And I was like, all right, cool, bet. So we get up to NCAAs and I swim prelims and I go personal best time and I end up getting first, right? And then I go up for finals and I get another personal best time, except for this time, the American. First, it went a 169. Um, and it, on top of that, it was actually, remember I told you guys earlier, my idol was Amy Van Dyken, the 96 Olympic, four-time Olympic gold medalist. It was her American record that I broke. So I went from having this idol that I aspired to, to now I'm swimming NCAAs, I'm winning and I'm breaking an American record that my idol previously held. So that was a, that was a pretty amazing experience and probably one I'll never forget. I had no idea I was even close to the American record. I just wanted to, like I said earlier, I wanted to get points for my team, my team UGA right. all the way. Mm -hmm. And then I touched a wall, broke an American record. And that was just another moment in my career that I was like, okay, I'm a good 50 freestyler. Mm -hmm. um, one fun fact I will add in before the next question. Um, I actually... And the only swimmer, male or female, to win a conference title in all the freestyle events. So 50 free, 100 free, 200 free, 500, and the mile. I've won every single one of them. Wow. So you guys, look, you need to reach out to Marissa if you all have any questions on how to be like her. <laughs> She's amazing, guys. So I hope that you all uh, reach out to her after this interview, okay? <laughs> So oh, thank have, you. <laughs> I do have another question um, from Eric. Um, he wants to know what training do you suggest for stamina? Yeah, training training is interesting. So I came from a distance based background, and I'll tell you, show you my story, but I will also kind of give you a couple additional tips about stamina. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in swimming, it's all about building your endurance. Um, as I grew up in my 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 swim training, it, I swam with 
a distance-based program. So we were doing 8,000 meters a practice, <laughs> layer in doubles, I'm doing 16,000 meters of practice. Um, so my coach is very much on like, okay, let's do 10 500s or 10, um, you know, on Saturdays, I think we did something crazy one time, like 10 1000s, like, yeah, that was crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the kind of stuff that helped me build my stamina of being able to swim those long races, but also I love sprint. So I worked on my speed. I was able to hop up and do, if you ever get a chance to see the video of my 50 freestyle, I had the slowest stroke rate out of all the sprinters in that pool. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because of my endurance background. And I, I will share that, you know, as young athletes right now, the best thing you can do is to have that endurance background and to start building up your stamina. Even if you're not in the water, stay active, get that cardio in. That's kind of the things that you want to have. Your, like a healthy heart will keep you healthy in the water and keep your endurance and your stamina up. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of sets that can help you with stamina. For me, um, you know, I, I actually love doing repetitive stuff and trying to hold a certain time. And what I mean by that is like, okay, if you're going to do, let's say 2050s, and you want to have a short rest, but try to keep your time as fast as possible, but the same throughout all 2050s. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So it's just more about like that stamina is going to be built the more you push yourself to stay at a faster speed for a longer period of time. Like it's not about, you know, going to practice and seeing like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do a fast 100. That's not how you build. That's not how you build stamina. The ability to learn how to build a fast pace for your for your 100 is how you're gonna be faster for that 100 at the end of the day so i hope that makes sense Greg or eric yeah i think your question kind of goes into like aubrey daniels um mm -hmm. i wanted to know like what do you do to stay in shape while you aren't in the pool but can you touch on that a little bit more yeah, I think it's more like just stay active, guys. You guys, you, you spend a lot of hours in the pool. Don't be afraid to spend a lot of hours on land either and doing something active. And you can you can make it fun. You can do Zoom calls with your teammates and maybe do a, a quick dry land workout with them. Go running with a buddy. Um, there's lots of different things that you can do to, to just, um, you know, stay in shape. And again, watch what you're eating. You know, you're, again arms length away from the fridge, hold it back a little bit and, and have a, have a little um, resilience against, you know, going after the bad foods that you kind of want to munch on a little bit. So really just, just staying active. I can't stress that enough of, of getting off the couch and doing something that kind of gets your heart healthy. Yeah. And I want to mention that Aubrey is not only a swimmer, but she is a coach. So thanks so much for that question, Aubrey. Um, <laughs> I think she was um, honored at the last National Black Heritage Championship sweet swim meet in Cary, North Carolina. So thanks for your question, Aubrey. Uh -huh. And I want to take it back um, a little bit to talk about, um, you know, how like I asked you about how the swim world has changed. But what do you think um, needs to be done to help um, change the demographics of um, competitive swimming, like getting more black swimmers in the pool? Like what can people do to, and like other people's roles, like as swimmers to help other young swimmers be more active in um, competitive swimming? Spread the word. Mm -hmm. It's plain and simple. I think it's all about, you know, swimming hasn't been a conversation for black people ever. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to change that. We want to, as, as, Black swimmers, let's have the conversation and find out how many of your friends know how to swim, how many of your friends don't know how to swim. Give them that introduction. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think too, people need to be educated about the, the healthy lifestyle that swimming provides, yeah. the um, opportunities for jobs that swimming provides, this, the opportunity for scholarships that swimming provides. I think that you know, it's all about education. That's, you know, that's another reason why I love blackkidswim.com is because anything that you need to know about swimming and the reasons that people give you of why they don't swim black kids swim answers and says here's why you can there's no excuses we you got the hair covered you know yvonne shields is on there there's ways to protect your hair yeah. um i can't tell you how many times i get that that from people is like i don't you know i don't i don't want to mess up my hair i got a lot of hair too i figured <laughs> out how to take care of it 
it might not be the same for everybody, but you know, we can figure out how to do it. Um, and swimming is just so fun. Like it's, it's just such an amazing sport. Like if you don't know how to swim, you can't go to the beach, you can't go to pool parties, you know, why not learn how to swim? So I think it's about, you know, offering the information as to why you should be swimming and anybody who gives you an excuse, answer, answer their excuse by saying there are no excuses and here's why. So um, we, we still have a lot of work to be done, but again, let's look as, as advocates, as swimming advocates, you guys love the sport. Don't forget to share the love and, and, and spread the word of like how important it is to learn how to swim and how fun it is to be a competitive swimmer. Most definitely. And I love that you talked about hair. You yes. know, that's a major topic <laughs> within our community. Tell me about how you were able to like maintain your curls and just keep your hair intact um, while swimming. You know, this is, this is something that will be different for everybody. You guys know nobody's hair is the exact same way, mm -hmm. but you should not be afraid to try different routines. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do a ton of research about my hair. My mom didn't do a ton of research. This was just something that I figured out how to do over the years. And honestly, I don't swim anymore, but I probably still do a lot of the same stuff <laughs> that I did when I was swimming. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing for me and for, for my hair was, um, and everybody always tells me that my hair is, is so healthy, so soft and very curly. And it's because I took the time to take care of it and I continue mm -hmm. to take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I made sure that I didn't wash my hair with shampoo every single time after, after I swam. Mm -hmm. I think that dries out my hair too much. Um, I would condition it every time after practice. Um, and I would rinse through my hair really well and make sure it was super clean. And then um, I was really, I loved moisturizers. Like after I was done swimming, I'd leave it, I'd do a leave-in conditioner or a nice thick moisturizer just to kind of kind of keep that, um, that moisture in my hair. Cause you know, chlorine and hair, Actually, chlorine and anything don't mix well. Y'all see what it does to your swimsuits. Don't think it ain't doing it to your hair too. <laughs> a lot of people think that a swim cap keeps the water out of your hair. That's not the case. You know, it'll reduce it, but the swim cap's there to keep your hair out of your face. So just take take the time to learn, you know, different things that, that work for your hair. My thing was conditioning it every single time after I got out of the pool. Um, and I would shampoo it like twice a week. I put moisturizers in every single night and just making sure that I'm cognizant of like hair ties. You know, I don't, I try not to use hair ties in my, in my hair at night. Mm -hmm. um, I do this, but it's probably not good for everybody. I actually go to sleep. I wash my hair every single night now that I'm not swimming mm -hmm. and I go to sleep with my hair wet. Everybody's like, don't ever do that. So, you know, you can take that. You don't have to take it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. Find something that works for you, but take the time to, to take care of your hair. Mm -hmm. um, you'll appreciate it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, I think, well, actually, May 25th, guys, we'll have a chat with um, Bruce Johnson, who is the owner of Avatar Salon here in Maryland. So, guys, if you need some useful hair tips, please tune in, and we will talk everything um, regarding hair, whether it is like deep conditioning, how to maintain your hair outside and in, in, you know, outside the pool or just everyday life. So make sure that you all tune in for that as well. So I want to see if anyone um, have any other questions. We have five minutes left. So if anyone has additional questions, please be sure to ask. I want to um, take the time, Marissa, to tell you, thank you so much for joining us today for our chat. Um, I loved our conversation and I'm very appreciative of you taking the time to talk about your experience and you being the inspiration for all of us, including, you know, everyone that's tuned in and people who are not tuned in. So hopefully we'll be able to have you on sooner than later again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brianna. And everybody who tuned in and who's tuning in later, I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for having me and for listening and enjoy swimming. Swimming is an amazing sport um, and I've loved it from day one. So I'm still involved with swimming. I have two kids now and the only thing that we hate right now is the fact that we can't go to the pool because of the pandemic, but you know, we're, we're figuring out how to buy some like inflatable pools so that we can at least <laughs> touch water in some way, shape or form. So you guys can always find me. I have a website at MarissaMcClendon.com. You can find me on social. I'm an open book. So if you guys ever just need to chat, ask me about practices, ask me about training tips, hair tips. I got a lot y'all. So, <laughs> 
um, just let just let me know. I'm here. Okay, and I think I have, like, I have one more question um, that just came in from Diane. I think Diane wants to know more about how was your experience swimming and being a student? Very good question. So swimming and being a student, you guys know it's a lot of juggling of hours. Um, you know, I will give kudos to my dad for putting me on a really good schedule <clears throat> when I was younger. And I would make the time to go to practice. I would go to school. You know, I go to practice in the morning. So here, I'll give you a daily routine. <clears throat> I would wake up at 4.30, be at practice at 5, get out, be, you know, get out of the pool about 6.45. I'd be at school by like 7.15. I would go to school all day, come back, do an hour of dry land about 4 o'clock, back in the pool at 5, out at 7, and then I go home, eat dinner, and do homework. Mm -hmm. My dad actually had me on a study schedule. So making it a, a point to say, okay, after dinner, we're going to study for, you know, or do schoolwork for at least an hour and a half, two hours if I had the time or if I needed the time, um, but just kind of putting myself on a little bit more of a schedule. And one of the, the things that I looked for when I was doing college recruiting was a place that understood that I was a swimmer, but also supported me as a student. Yeah. So my swim coach, Jack Bowerly at University of Georgia, he, the very first thing he said, he's like, we're, we're happy that you're here as a swimmer, but don't forget you're a student athlete with the student part coming first. Okay. So mm -hmm. making sure that we stay on top of like our studies, if we needed, if we needed additional help, there was tutors that were available and, and they strongly encouraged that you work with tutors if needed. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's really about finding a balance and it's okay to write yourself a schedule. I had it, had it up on my wall, like, okay, I'm going to do science on, on Mondays, math on Tuesdays, and things like that. So don't be afraid to give yourself a, a schedule that kind of keeps your grades up. I graduated with honors from high school. Um, I could have been on a partial academic scholarship if I wanted to for college and also got my college degree. So yeah, it's doable. So guys, you know, like, to do lists, you know, they're very valuable and, you know, um, swimming helps you, you know, outside of the, you know, the actual sport. So thanks so much for noting that, Marissa. Absolutely. Okay. And guys, I just want to let you all know, like, that is it for today. And that I uh, want to remind you all that we will be announcing our future chats that will be coming up within the next few weeks and few days, actually. And make sure that you um, check out our um, YouTube channel to watch our online workouts and HU swimmers, um, um, you know, lead those workouts as well. So um, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and please share what you're doing to stay in swim shape and tag us at Black Kids Swim. And um, I want to remind you all about the essay competition. I want you all to, you know, have a fair chance at getting these prizes. So I want to do like a quick recap about that. Um, you'll, we'll, we, you will win a BKS gift bag and um, it will be featured on your our website. For eight and unders, um, you can write a 200 word essay of why you love swimming. For nine to 12 year olds, a 500 word essay about what it, I believe it takes to be an elite swimmer. And 13 and age up, a thousand word essay, do black competitive swimmers have a responsibility to the black community? So the deadline is June 13, 2020, and email submissions to info at blackkidswim.com with the subject line, BKS essay contest. So thank you again, Marissa, and hopefully we will have you back on soon to talk about some other topics, okay? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Bye, Bat Kids Swim community. Love you guys. Bye, everyone. <laughs>